Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending the webinar today. We're very excited for this webinar. Um, we're just going to do a little bit of housekeeping announcements before we get started, before I hand it over to David and Dave. My name is Melissa Schwartz, and I wear many hats here at Training Peaks, but this is part of our educational department. Um, the webinars series that we bring you every month is led out of my area. And we also have Kelly Bates, who's a professional account manager, on the line. Kelly will be helping answer some of the questions that pop up throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions for Dave or David, we're going to set aside about 15 minutes at the end for them to answer questions. You have a little question box over on the right-hand side. Um, go ahead and enter any questions you have about their presentation or, you know, if they say something and you want them, uh, you have a question on it, put it in that area. Kelly and I will be collecting those questions and we will um, have Dave and David answer them at the end. If you have a question regarding your Training Peaks account, please go to our support page and submit a, a support ticket that way. Um, Kelly and I are, we can answer some questions, but we're better off having you go through our support channels for that. So, um, as I said, we've got David Glover joining us. David is the author of the book Full Time and Sub Nine, Fitting Iron Distance Triathlon into Everyday Life. He has a master's in exercise physiology and lives, trains, and coaches in Boulder, Colorado. We also have Dave Scott on the line. Um, Dave is a six-time Ironman world champion. He's been the head coach for a team in training for many years, and he's been coaching for over 40 years. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you guys. So David, I'm going to give you presenter rights, and you can share your presentation. Uh, thanks, Melissa. And this, um, as Melissa said, this is uh, David Glover, and here with uh, Dave Scott. I'm, I'm actually going to let him do most of the talking, but I'm going to help uh, facilitate the presentation. He's got the better stories. So, hello, you, hello, you all. I just thought I'd uh, say hi. David always has a sterling introduction. So, uh, yeah, we, we've got a, a interesting topic to uh, cover today, and sometimes with some 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 ways a little bit of nebulous uh, topic, but being prepared mentally for the race. So, David, take it away. Sure. So, the whole premise behind this is basically that what, what the slide says is preparing mentally for race day is just as important as, as training your body. And in fact, in studies, when the physical, technical, and mental readiness of, of Olympic athletes was assessed, only mental readiness significantly predicted performance. So, all else being equal, this can make the difference. Uh, I think when we look at mental readiness, I'm, I'm just going to start off with just a short story about Chrissy Wellington, and I'm sure everyone who's listening today uh, certainly knows her quite well and knows her incredible athletic history. Uh, I've had a fortunate opportunity to coach Chrissy over the last three plus years, and um, sort of fell into the situation. Uh, I think the time was right for her, and and we seemed to click right away, and and uh, it was a golden opportunity for me to work with someone that was so talented. And um, ironically, uh, what David just said, this mental readiness, and what the previous slide said, do what you can do at the moment. Uh, I'm just going to take you back to this last year in, in Kona, uh, 2011 in October. And, and again, those of you that um, know about the Ironman history, uh, Christy had a, a sterling year and set the world record in, in Ironman Roth, went eight hours and 18 minutes, and really had a wonderful preparation. I felt felt as though if the conditions in Kona dictated that she was really ready for the race, uh, she was capable of shattering her world record time uh, in Kona, which even to this day is, is fairly so soft, um, despite her most incredible finish that she had this year. So leading up to the race, everything was going to the plan. Uh, we'd laid it out very strategically, and um, mentally she was ready to just really un load or unfold just a, uh, an incredible race, and, and obviously Marinda and the other athletes were hopefully going to push her to a, a great performance. Two weeks prior to the race, she had a crash and uh, went down. I uh, had swam with her in the morning, which I rarely do, and my son Drew was 
uh, was in the water at the same time. And uh, they went out for their final kind of long ride and in a couple of days. They were both going to get on the plane, head over to Kona as, as well as myself. And so I, I think in looking at this story from day 14, the day of the crash, day 13, day 12, uh, this has been profiled. Day 12 before the race, we, there was two of us, uh, Tom Lowe, her boyfriend and myself, who carried Chrissy out of the gym. She had abrasions up and down her side, uh, big contusions all over her entire body. And so the, the plan that we had developed, the strategy that we had developed, uh, we had to all of a sudden implement a new plan. And the new plan really came about was this mental readiness that David referred to, that we had to adopt a new plan. And it was a really a plan for every day. And I'm going to cover this a little bit more as we get into the slides. But I think the most important element uh, at the outset and what I'm <clears throat> trying to relate to all of you is that uh, do what you can do at the moment, be in the moment, be present, be adaptable, and be able to still take the risks within the realm of your training program. And, and I, I think a lot of times we're overcome by things that come up during the race or train that seem to consume us. And mentally they devour us. And when that happens, all of a sudden we take a step back, we take a further step back. And I've been around so many athletes, uh, as Melissa said, I've been coaching for 40 years, it's a long time, and thinking about that, uh, that already concede their ability or their potential when something comes up. So when seemingly disaster strikes, there is still that element to extract that, your highest potential, and that's what we're going to cover today. Okay, and this, this slide basically kind of summarizes what we're going to cover. Um, so st if you read this timeline from left to right, so we're starting you know, roughly about six months out from your goal race, whatever it may be, all the way up to race day. And we're going to kind of talk about you know, what, what are your, you know, looking at the whole season, but then you know, as, you, as you go along, having the importance of short-term goals, um, drafting a race plan, actually practicing that plan, and then um, talk about some things you can actually use and practice in your training that will help you on race day. Um, mantras, taking that physical self inventory, and then as, as Dave said um, just now, and we'll bring up again, is just you know being in the moment, and then that uh, lightning bolt, you know, so stuff's going to happen, you know, whether it's getting sick or accident or a bike crash. Um, so you know, some some tips to deal with, deal with that kind of stuff as well. So one of the, the questions I always ask my athletes that I coach, and I haven't been coaching quite as long as Dave, and in fact, he's, I think he started coaching when I was born. <laughs> uh -huh. Very funny. Um, and, uh, you know, it's what's your why. And, you know, when you're out on the course and, you know, even in your training, and I had a number of athletes who, I, I'm originally from the East Coast, so I have a number of athletes I coach back in Virginia and New Jersey. Uh, Maryland, and you know it's been an atrocious heat, and you know they have, they have to go out. They've got Ironmans coming up in the next month or two, so they're out doing their long rides and runs, and you know it's just not the best conditions. And you know, but you, what is their reason for doing it? You know, why are they out there? Um, you know, what's what's your why? What's going to get you through when you when you want to give up? And I was thinking about that today. That actually, they swim practice. I'm not having a great swim, and I was thinking, gosh, why am I here? Um, but you know, when we, you know, you have that reason why, and, and I like what Nietzsche says. Uh, he has a why to live can bear almost any how. Um, you know, and that came from man's search for meaning. But I think it's important to be able to ask yourself and answer that question before you do anything, Dave. It's sometimes difficult to identify, David. You're a good example today in the water because I had to keep your tail in the water and make sure that you didn't climb out halfway through the workout, but. Uh, it, it really comes back to what internally drives you or, or your intrinsic motivation versus your extrin extrinsic motivation. And we, we quite often look at our competitors as the defining term for, for what really motivates us. And, and I always tell the athletes that I coach that this is really secondary and that we really need to establish the um, terms within ourselves so that we're able to drive ourselves internally. and. Uh, a lot of athletes that I coach use all the tools and the devices that use GPS and they use power meters and heart rate monitors and perceived exertion and speed and so on. But some simplify, and Chrissy was a good example of this. She didn't want to use all the tools. She certainly had access to them. And what really motivated her, and, and ironically myself, the fact that I'm old and I didn't have those tools available to me, 
Um, I had a wristwatch, and my drive, my innate drive, that I was able to uh, drive myself to build each day in my training and then project that into the race was really internally motiva motivated. It wasn't what Mark Allen was doing or what Scott Timmate was doing or some of the older guys that I raced back in my my generation. So I think, you know, David, what you said, we really have to kind of look at the why and what really internally motivates us to be hungry for the day-to-day -day games that we play because this sport is brutally hard. It is wickedly hard. Uh, I look at baseball players right now and occasionally watch some of their uh, their talents and I think, Gee, you know what, those guys aren't hungry. Uh, is their drive innately as difficult as what we do? And I'm not patting ourselves on the back, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that we drive those little steps, those little goals, which we will talk about uh, in some of the future slides. So keep it within yourself. And we talked about when we start, you really want to kind of take start with that big picture. So, you know, ask yourself an answer, you know, what's your why for doing all this? But, you know, when, you, when we look at your overall season, you know, what's, what's your, you know, what are your objectives? You know, what are the key races you're thinking about, whether, you know, it's just to finish your first sprint triathlon or it's to qualify for a Kona or, you know, racing the Ironman 70.3 World Championships, whatever it is. And I think it's, a, or we think it's important to kind of consider your level of commitment. And, and by that, if you look at, Commitment as a spectrum, starting at the you know at a low level of commitment might be you know you wish to do something, all the way to hope to like to try to want, and then you know the highest level is the I want I commit, and you know, the, the thing is it really applies to everyone whether you're an elite athlete you can be a, a talented athlete and just have a low level of commitment or you could be you know just say you know someone starting out. Um, works full time, doesn't have a lot of time to train, doesn't have a lot of experience, but you still have that high level equipment. So it, it doesn't really, it's not a label for your skill or anything, but really, you know, just what is, you know, your level of desire? And there's really no right answer, but the, the one key point is, you know, wh wherever you are, if you're trying to get to a, a higher level, whether that's a longer race or a faster time or better performance, you're gonna, you, you may have to move up the commitment scale. Dave? Uh, part of this uh, slide and looking at this slide, <clears throat> Dave and I, we glean a lot of stuff from other professionals and unfortunately I had a great opportunity to, to meet a sports psychologist in 1994. I'd raced uh, through the 80s and won the six times during the 80s and decided to come back in 94 and, and during that time, uh, 1989, I had this epic race with Mark Allen in 1994, I kind of wrestled whether or not I really wanted to return and, and finally I de developed this innate internal hunger, which I just had talked about. So I met with a sports psychologist, and he talked exactly what David would just, <clears throat> was just bringing up. He said, you know, I want you to make a list, and, and this was a really good exercise for me. He said, I want you to make a list of all the things that you should do or, or you feel like you have to do, um, and then I want you to, to make a list that uh, really says what you really want. Well, the should have and the could have uh, was quite extensive, and the want list was very finite. It was well defined. I wanted to come back, and I wanted to, wanted to do extremely well, and I wanted to be able to go through the process of pushing myself as far as I as far as I could go. So I think w what Dave was, say, was saying, when you look at this um, uh, spectrum, and we get to the far right side, and we can really put those last two words together: I want to commit. And once you make that commitment, once you actually write that down and you tell yourself, this is what I want, the clarity in your goals become very well defined and your overall objective becomes clearly defined. And this is exactly what I uh, decided to do. One other thing that the sports psychologist said, he said, you can choose to be responsible for the things that you should do. In other words, at the time that you're training, at the time that you have something that is very goal-oriented, there are things that we can procrastinate on for months and months and months, and, and when they finally passed, we realized, yeah, I spent so much mental energy worrying about this. So he said, what would you like to do, and what would you like to do as far as being responsible for your tasks or your objectives? And he said, if you can put those aside, do that. And that's exactly what I did. So I had about six months of preparation for the 94 race, and um, overall, it was a great, great race for me. I uh, had a five-year hiatus, and a uh, little Australian guy, Greg Welch, I kept watching his running togs during the run, just couldn't catch the guy at the end, but uh, came in second that year, and it was a, a good show for me. David? Uh, this, this particular slide, I'm going to jump in here. Um, 
One of the areas that all type A athletes, I think when I deal with uh, triathletes, we are really looking at type A personalities, and it's this area of fear. And there's four identifiable fears, uh, looking at the slides, the fear of the unknown, the fear of disappointment, fear of commitment, and I'm, I'll wait till the last uh, two, which are kind of tied together. The fear of the unknown, we, we all have that as we step into our first race, and we recognize, gee, you know, what's going to happen throughout the swim? You know, can I get through that transition area? And, and the unknown is very, very present. But I always tell even the first timers, including my team and training athletes that I coach, the first time they step into the race, and, and, and I certainly can reflect way back when, when I did my first race in 1976, what could I control? And that allowed me to eliminate the unknown. If I take it step by step, if I be present, to do what I can at the moment, that allowed me to eliminate the, the unknown. The fear of disappointment is really within myself. Uh, I recognize that my family and friends, regardless of the performance that I had, they were always there as my support channel. And, and certainly as the sport flourished and my notoriety in this sport, uh, began to grow that I wasn't disappointing the journalists. They could write about Mark Allen as he beat me. It didn't really matter. So it was important for, for me to recognize that the disappointment, as long as my goals were internally developed, that I could eliminate that fear. Fear of commitment, I rarely find that this is an issue with triathletes. We are committed. We are committed. And I think the commitment that we need is just to be defined in in your exercise sessions that you have to write those down, when can you fit those into your busy curriculum? And, and we're all busy. As I walked into the office today and just mentioned to David, I said, my schedule's so darn crazy. And I always allocate the time, even if it's a shortened time, to commit myself to exercise, exercise because I know that it makes me feel mentally ready and mentally prepared. So that commitment, I think, that we have is always there. The last one, the fear of failure and the fear of success. Boy, we hover, and I say we, triathletes hover, on this fine little pendulum or pinnacle. We have a tendency not to recognize our successes, and so as we move up the ladder and we establish these, these incremental improvements in our training, our progression, we have a good race, we always kind of forget about recognizing our accomplishments, and it's important to recognize those small ones because they add up. It's not just that last last race. And, and lastly, uh, in the box there, if you have faith within yourself, faith breeds the highest probability of success. And even in moments where you feel like your train slipping away, you had a poor race, maybe you had two in a row, don't lose that power within. Don't lose that faith within because that will allow you to succeed and you will be successful. David? And, uh, and just to kind of Graphically, or with a picture, it kind of describes some of the things Dave is talking about. That that um, you know, focusing on things you can control. St Stephen Covey of Seven Habits fame uses um, three circles, and you know, if you look at the smallest circle, and, and it's a little bit busy slide, but if you look at the smallest circle, it's a, it's a circle of control. Um, the next larger circle is your circle of influence, and then finally your circle of concern. And they're 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 that size for reasons. So there's very few things you can actually control. You can you know, when you talk about training races, you can control what you wear, you can control what races you sign up for, you can control when you start your bike ride. You know, I mentioned, you know, it's really hot back east, so if you start your ride at, you know, 2 in the afternoon, you're going to suffer. If you start at 6 in the morning, you can maybe get through um, at least part of it when it's not too hot. Um, things you can influence. So you can't necessarily influence or you can't control how the swim start is, but you can influence how your swim is by where you start. You know, if you're not a, if you're a strong swimmer, you start out front. If you're not, maybe you start at the back. And then finally, that larger circle of things that concern. These are the things that you have no control over. And and what happens? And um, it's easy to sit there. And, and uh, I'm also a, a race director for the Blue Ray Triathlon in August. And and sure enough, so, you know, a week before the race, I get hundreds of emails. What's the water temperature? What's the water temperature? What's it? You know, what's it? You know, what's the kind of like. You know, here, well, here's what it is today. It may change, and and um, interesting enough, it tends to be rainy in the, in the, in the afternoons there, so it can it can literally be wet so legal one day and not the next. But it it, it's, it just amazes me. It, it, there's such it's such a tendency to focus on things that really are, are outside of control, rather than focus on on the things we, we can't control. And 
and and as Dave, you know, the media always said that the, the tougher conditions, the better for you. Is that is that true? Uh, well, well, not really. <laughs> but I actually allowed that to sort of enhance my profile because I was sort of built up like, boy, if the conditions are really, really rough, and I'll use Hawaii for example, if the the sea was going to be real rough in the morning, and there were times there was a lot of chop, as you were talking about. And certainly the winds were very unpredictable, and we, we had some hellacious years where the wind was just uh, atrocious, and certainly the week leading up to the race, there's every athlete that's out there on the Queen K, and they'd say, gee, the crosswinds today were 30 miles an hour, and the headwinds the next day. And I would always get questions, well, what do you think about the conditions? And, you know, I recognized early on that it was really, it, it suited me to, not be concerned, as you said, about all the external things that I couldn't control. And so I actually flipped it and said, you know, I actually like those really horrible conditions and rough water and bring on the wind. And, and I'm thinking to myself, gee, I'm lying through my teeth while I'm saying this. But it was something that I actually relished when I was racing because when the conditions actually uh, came to, to prediction and they were dreadful conditions, I realized that what I could control was to do that physical inventory, which you were talking about, David, and we're going to come back to this a little bit, and those mental mantras that allowed me to relax. And I realized that the wind was not going to blow for 112 miles in my face. And I think what I felt from the other athletes in talking to numerous athletes that have been in very, very, very difficult conditions, when you dwell on it, and it's really out of your control, then all of a sudden you lose that ability to focus and you lose that ability to perform well. So I, I think it's, you know, it's important to recognize that you can really garner strength in difficult conditions. And, and you know, basically kind of the, what Kevin also said, by focusing on those things you can control and, and you know, to the extent that you can influence, you can actually expand those circles. And so rather than, you know, worrying, you know, about the water temperature, the winds, um, you know, you can't control them, but you, you can still pre obviously prepare for them and, um, you know, then, you know, focus that mental energy on the things you can't control. Okay. Uh, again, I mentioned I had a great opportunity working with Chrissy, but I also uh, have been an advisor for Craig Alexander and about four years ago, uh, actually five years ago now, Craig came to me and he said, you know, I really need to upgrade my strength program. And, and you know, I was looking at him, I said, gee, he's a world champion, the guy's a pretty darn good athlete. And, and I'm sure he's, you know, been pretty diligent about his strength. And, and so I said, well, let's just run through some tests and we'll, we'll see how you're doing. And shockingly, both of them, uh, and I would say this to their face, they know it, uh, were just abysmal. They were so asymmetrical. Uh, both left sides were, were just dreadful. Uh, poorly developed glutes. They had low back problems, uh, weak hamstrings. And when I went through some of the exercises with Craig, and, and he realized it right away, he's looking in the mirror and he's collapsing and his, his knee is falling immediately and, and he just doesn't have the, the strength to even do a single leg stance with a little bit of knee flexion. He recognized that, golly, here's an area that I can control. And if I can control this by applying the same energy that I have to my swim, bike, run, wow, this is going to give me a huge, not only physical strength, that is secondary, but it really allowed them the mental strength to say, you know what, if I do my strength training and I'm diligent at, at this, this is one more little ingredient above and beyond my competitors and certainly one more uh, ingredient that's going to allow me to really extract my highest potential. And again, it kind of came back to them because they both realized what a huge void in their programs. And so I, I think when, we, when we're able to look at this uh, areas that David had just mentioned about controlling this. This is a real genuine area that both Christy and Craig uh, recognized that was so totally underdeveloped. And I'm not talking again about the physical side. I'm talking about the mental side that they gained from doing the physical side of enhancing their strength program. Huge. And just to add on to that, I, I work with a lot of athletes. I, I, you know, I hear a lot of my clients say, oh, you know, I saw my friend, he's out riding, and, you know, I'm going to work. and and, and, you know, kind of what Dave is basically saying is, you know, rather than focus on what everyone else is doing and trying to, you know, be like the Joneses, you know, if you can focus on the things you can control, that's what makes a difference. And so the, the next topic is goal setting, and and I, I, I use this reference a lot, but, you know, in a, in a review of 100 plus goal setting studies, they found that basically goals, goals work. You know, it's one of the most robust and replicable findings in the psychological literature. In fact, 90% of the studies show positive or partially positive effects. So now I want to kind of 
talk to you on how to implement uh, goal strategies that, that can work for you. Yeah. I, I think the the important thing on the on the goals is that um, we, we, we keep them very short term and uh, when we look at the goals uh, you can kind of look at look at them as uh, stepping stones and on these stepping stones I think this is a, this is a great little visual uh, when we have these stepping stones and I'll go back to Christy when she had her uh, accident 14 days before Kona was unable to compete the previous year due to illness and had to withdraw the night before the race that everything was built about her confidence and about regaining her. And it was a day program to allow her to take these little steps. And when I talk to athletes about setting goals, and this is not the, the yearly objective, it's generally much easier if you look at short-term goals. And I found with triathletes, if you establish those goals every 10 to 14 days, you have breakthrough workouts. Uh, typically, if you can have one or two breakthrough workouts, and maybe it's something that you're monitoring, maybe it's your power output on your bike, maybe it's your time trial on your run, maybe it's a, uh, your perceived exertion, whatever you use as one of your tools allows you to psychologically enhance your performance. So um, I, I think this, this slide is a, is a beautiful slide in, in kind of looking at that the overall long-term objective is really those small little steps in between. And it comes back to what I said earlier about savoring those successes along the way. Uh, for, for an athlete that's flowing along, you may find that you can set that goal four to six weeks outside of this 10 to 14 days that I just said. When things are flowing, it, it's easy to keep yourself in rhythm. And, and we might have uh, two or three periods during the year, certainly the build-up phase that everyone goes through, you can almost see on a daily basis, yeah, I'm getting stronger and stronger, and your projection four to six weeks out is I'm going to be at this certain level. And you may see this also during during the competitive year. And, and I saw this with, with Chrissy post-Roth. She just had a beautiful buildup uh, for that six to eight weeks and ten weeks, and then all of a sudden, whammo, uh, she got in this accident. So keep your goals short. Keep them tight. Most of you will really flourish by doing that. This is, uh, again, to use a picture of what, what, how goals might work. And, and I have this you know, shown as a, a stair step. So as you start at the lower bottom with today, and the example I gave is a, an, an athlete who's done an Ironman in 13.25 and had stomach problems. And, you know, you kind of start at the beginning of, you know, with this presentation, talk about, you know, kind of what's your objectives this season, what's your why, and what are you trying to accomplish? And that's basically the top of the steps in this case. The athlete wants to you know, do a 12 hour Ironman and successfully execute a nutrition strategy. So that's your long term goals or objectives. And then as Dave talked about, you know, it's, it's, it's so far out, you've you got to have the short term goals. And, and I just listed two here, but there, there could be, you know, if we're talking six months, there's probably, you know, 12 to 15 short term goals to get to those long term goals. But these are, these are just some examples. Um, and the, the key point is that, you know, that they, they are, you know, there's the short enough that you, you can, you know, see progress and measure it and get that, that quick win and then go on go on to something, you know, go on to the next one. Um, some tips for setting goals. I use a SMART acronym, so keep, keep them simple, um, measurable. So at the end of the day, you have to be able to say yay or nay whether you achieve them. Uh, it's achievable, and research suggests that you want to do moderately difficult but still doable goals. If you set them too far out there that you can't ever achieve them, then that, that could be self-defeating. Um, relevant, are the goals relevant to what you're trying to accomplish? If you're, um, you know, do they help you get to your overall objectives? And then finally, time bound. So a, a, a goal without a deadline is, is, is a dream. So again, you know, they, they suggest that 10 to 14 um, day period, and that gives you, you know, short something short term that you can that you can uh, accomplish then before moving on to the next one. Um, other tips: focus on the positive. You know, ground your goals on past results. Um, set short term and long term. We talked about, and then finally, you know, it's important not just to focus on the competition, but also the training as well. So for my my swim today, um, my goal was simply to finish the practice. Um, you know, if I was feeling better, then maybe I would have had some some time goals as well. Um, but the, probably the most important point highlighted in yellow 
you know, write down your goals. It, it makes them real. It makes them tangible. And post them and look at them daily. Um, you know, you may, you may post them on your, your bathroom mirror. You may post them, you know, I, I typically post mine next to my computer at my desk, um, you know, in, in the front of your train log. But it, it gives you that constant reminder and that, that little bit of, of motivation of, of what, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, okay, so shifting to a race plan. And a, a race plan, you really think about it is, you know, what's your roadmap for race day? You know, what's your, you know, you're going to start the race. What's, you know, what are the, the guidelines you're, you're going to follow? What's your plan? Um, it, it can be, you know, basically a list of reminders, things to think about. And Dave suggests starting about six weeks out. And, you know, but it's important when you, when you put together this plan, and Dave's going to kind of walk through an example um, in the next slide. But it's important that you allocate thinking and planning time and put this in your schedule. And, and again, like goals, um, one thing that helps or one thing that I, I ask my athletes to, that I coach to do is, to, especially before their bigger races, you know, write down, you know, you know, draft out what you want to happen. You know, it's, it's sort of like if you write a race report after the race summarizing what happened, your, your race plan is basically you write it before the race summarizing what you want to happen. And another key point here, you know, focus on those big things. So focus on those, those sources of anxiety, those things that you, you maybe you fear that, you know, if you can address ahead of time, that you'll, you'll be, um, be able to deal with them better on race day. Uh, one of the things, David, that I have my athletes do is um, just to elaborate a little bit on your race plan is also recognize their strengths within a race. So once you've broken down that race, and again, it, you know, having the opportunity to go over the race, either in your car or on your bike or on the run, and knowing, knowing the different nuances of the race and the difficult sections of the race really allows your, within yourself to recognize your strengths and weaknesses. Because you'll hear this from your fellow athletes, oh, that's a real difficult section, or that's a false flat, or the headwinds are really, really strong, or there's multiple hills on the back side. And uh, having a golden opportunity to to view lots of, uh, of courses, and I remember going back to Ironman Canada, and you know, people were talking about the Richter Pass grade, and I said, you know, that's a nice steady grade. I said, once you get in a rhythm, that's a great rhythm climb. The difficult part is on the back side where there's three very steep hills. And I kind of looked at uh, Hawaii, and, I've, and I'll use this as an example. Uh, everyone wants to feel brilliant when they start out on the bike. We've got 112 miles, and you want to get into your flow. And, and I told them that the first five miles of the bike course is very non-rhythmic and extremely difficult. It goes up at the back side of Palani Hill, comes back down. Uh, you're having to spin real fast, and then you're <clears throat> climbing back up on a section that almost looks like a false flat, but it actually has a 300-foot gain. And you weave back through town and, and again, climb up an 8% grade on Polani Hill. Fairly graphic description of what goes on. And for those of you listening, you think, well, you know, what does that have to do with me? I, I think the important thing to recognize is that there may be a section at the outset of the, the Ironman race in Hawaii, the first five miles, and then an additional eight miles out to the airport entrance are really 5 plus 8, 13 miles where you may not have that fluidity. But if you break it down into pieces and you recognize the innate difficulty of the course and you monitor your physical tools that you have, and we'll cover this in just a second, but going from head to toe where you're telling your face to relax, your shoulders to relax, and you're putting your energy into your legs and your feet are nice and relaxed, you'll be able to control those difficult parts. And ironically, when people have a, a challenging section, I always have them related to actually a training section that has comparable difficulty. How do you get through that section? How long is that section? And, and just make sure that you recognize that it is relatively short term. The wind is not in your face the entire time. If it's 13 miles of the Ironman course in Hawaii, that's roughly 10% of the entire time. Uh, and obviously, there's, there's other difficult sections. So again, break it down into pieces allows you to psychologically tackle the difficulties of, of any course. Uh, I just want to, want to bring up uh, one story that uh, I, I had to deal with. And it was obviously a very personal story. And, and this has to deal with my son, Drew. Uh, he decided that he wanted to do triathlons. He was a Nordic skier. And, 
and uh, ironically club uh, qualified in Lubbock last year. We never even discussed that opportunity of going to Hawaii, and, and here he had, he had won his age group, and there was a slot for him. He turned to me, and he said, what do you think? Dad, should I go to Kona? And I said, well, it's your, really your decision. And I felt, you know, he needed more time. He was 20 years old. Uh, but he uh, had the conviction and said he wanted to do it. What happened was uh, two weeks before the race, when Chrissy went down, Drew was in that little group, and, and Drew crashed uh, on top of Chrissy, broke his wrist. And not only was I dealing with, with Chrissy's issues, but also my, my son's. And uh, he developed a pretty uh, bad cold. We went and had a wrist x-ray. They said, you need to cast it. We said, we, he has a big race coming up, by the way. And we said, we're going to have to wait until afterwards. So uh, I think the important thing to recognize with both Drew and Chrissy is, is and you know, trying to be their uh, father in Drew's case, but also his coach, was that we really had to adapt. And what David said right at the outset was that that mental readiness that uh, you're able to control is really the key to extracting your greatest potential. And um, just to finish out, Drew, he had a stellar day. He ended up getting two flats, and he was unable to change his tire due to this broken wrist, but he lost a little over an hour, uh, but ended up going 10 hours and 12 minutes. He looked at that race as, you know, my potential isn't even tapped. The time doesn't tell me anything about where I'm going to be able to go. And I, and I told him, you have to reflect back on the last two weeks on what you were able to control. And it really came down to those last five days, as it did with Chrissy. Uh, we had five days left. What can we do before that gun goes off? David? And so, you know, for you, it, it may not be an accident. Maybe it's work travel or, or family vacation, there, there, there may be a period of time when, you, when you're not able to, to train at, consistently or maybe not at all. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is, you know, when, when you stop training, you, you, you detrain. And, and your, your, some of your fitness parameters will change. I've um, listed a few of them here, like your VO2 max goes down, your blood plasma volume goes down, your exercising heart rate goes up. So if you take some time off and you go out and run, and, you know, maybe you've you used to run an eight-minute mile at a 140 beats per minute. Now it's 150. Um, so th all these things can can change. And you know the, the key note point to note is you know research has shown that you know detraining can take place within two to four weeks. Um, typically parameters worsen up to a point, then eventually uh, steady state. Um, but it's it's also important to note that a recently trained individual. So if you're someone or you're, you're a coach or works with someone that's basically new to endurance sports, you may see training induced gains completely reversed after more than four weeks. So that's the bad news. I, I think the good news is that what David was saying and on this slide is that if you have a few days off and uh, whatever dictated that, whether it was an injury or it was work or it was things going on at home, you're just unable to adhere to your program, is that quite often when you finally decide, okay, I've got to get back, generally on the first day, you don't feel terribly fluid. The second day, you might actually feel a little bit stiff and sore. You recognize that your muscles were worked on on that first day. And the third day, you start to feel a little bit better. And the irony is by day five, you can start to feel, and I put on here, you can feel magical. Well, maybe not magical, but you can certainly feel a lot better than the outset on, on, on day one. So. I think the, the most important thing to, to recognize on this, and I know that I've uh, mentioned Chrissy many, 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 many times, is that um, we had to really shift her goals, and it was a day-to-day -day program. Adapting day-to-day -day allowed her to say, you know what, I feel very bad. I got creamed in this crash. I'm still sore, very sore on day 13, day 12, day 11. By the fourth day, she was able to do a little workout, an easy run, an easy jog, uh, a light bike, and, and a very, very light swim. And I told her, I said, you're on the road back. And I was sort of biting my tongue as I was telling her this because I, you know, I was thinking, gee whiz, she's got the Ironman in, in eight days. <laughs> Is this really possible? But I also said it with the conviction that once she gains a little bit of confidence, her fitness is not lost, as David had just described, and that if we can build that mental confidence and that emotional stability, that she had the ability to 
to race as well as she possibly could, and she did. Okay, and now we're going to kind of talk you through a couple of things you can actually do on race day. So these are things you want to practice ahead of time in your training. The first one um, kind of gets back to what Dave was saying, um, he said a couple of times now, is about being in the moment. And one way to do that is the, the continuous self-check-in or that physical self-inventory. And you know, what is your body doing? How are you feeling? You know, are you going too fast? Or you, can you go faster? Um, what's your breathing doing? Can you relax your shoulders? So there's an example, some, some questions you can ask yourself to constantly monitor. So, so Dave, when we were racing Hawaii a number of times and obviously did quite well, how, how did you disassociate from, from the, the pain and the discomfort in your races? Well, first off, David, I don't use that word, pain. Uh, I use kind of an elongated phrase, a barometer of discomfort. Uh, pain is when you're really out of shape. Pain is when you're over the top. Pain is when you're out of control. Uh, when you have this barometer of discomfort, the discomfort levels, you can ratchet, them up, ratchet it up and ratchet it back down slightly. And we're all very in tune and we have an innate ability to bring that discomfort level up when we're training. And think of when you're in a group that's faster than you and they're pushing the pace on the bike and you're hanging on. That discomfort level can get, become, come up quite high. There may be a moment where the group backs off and you slide back down. If you're looking at your power output, it may have only dropped 15 or 20 watts, or your heart rate may have only come down three or four beats. And so that barometer becomes very, very finite in its calibration, and it's an internal calibration that you have. So uh, I, I think in saying this is that you have the ability to control what you're doing. And you know, specifically, we've talked about this physical assessment and relaxing your head and your face and going all the way down your shoulders, your fingers, wiggling your, wiggling your fingers, and breaking down the enormity of the event into small segments. And I tell people even that are racing a sprint distance, which is really not an appropriate term for our sport. A sprint distance is anywhere between an hour to two hours for, for most of our athletes. And you have to break it down into tangible, smaller chunks so that it's psychologically palatable and it makes it easy to flow along. I, I'm asked this question all the time. H how, did you, how did you manage the discomfort, the pain during Ironman? I said, you know, the race went by very, very fast. I never recognized that the race was eight hours and, and X minutes. It, it flowed by very, very quickly because I did exactly what I was just telling all of you. And a, a second tool that you can use in, um, are mantras or affirmations, which are basically simple positive statements that you can say in, in yourself or even out loud um, to help keep you focused and, and bring you back to the present. So you know, Dave talks about you know, being do what you can in the moment. Well, this is a, a tool you can use to bring yourself back to the moment. So when your mind starts to wander and you start thinking about how your feet hurt or how it's hot out or you're you know, getting tired. Um, you can use these saying you know, these these um, mantras. Like, um, for example, on the on the swim, it might be head down, hips up. Um, or on the run, you know, when my feet make contact with the ground, I barely see feel my toes making an impression. Using these tools can help you bring you back to that present moment. So you can you can do you know what you can. And using that, you know, again, you can also tie that to this physical self inventory. So, so Dave. Yeah, I use some mantras. I use visualization, and I'm fairly graphic when I describe um, different uh, exercises to the athletes that I coach because I'm, a, I'm very, very visual, and I'll, I'll be very specific uh, in an example. Uh, I always felt that I had this most elegant running form that I just flowed along. <laughs> well, I saw myself on videotape fairly early on in Kona, and I said, well, that, that is the biggest joke in the world. And of course, you know, people would mimic my running form. My feet were turned out. My chest was up. My head was real high. Uh, it was horrific. And uh, I, you know, I always <clears throat> thought of myself as this free-flowing gazelle. And then all of a sudden, I saw a videotape of Mark Allen. I said, you know, he's a gazelle. I, I look like a wounded buffalo. But I think the important, <laughs> the important message on this is that when you're doing this sort of physical assessment, that you can allow yourself to develop that fluidity, that easiness, and to have a visual picture or a mantra, stay, stay smooth, stay powerful, stay focused, be light on your feet. 
all those things help. And you have to program yourself not on race day. This has to be done during your training sessions when you're laboring. And, and I think it's key when, you, when you're in difficult times, how can you pull yourself out of that particular difficult spot? And again, that visualization or mantras are, is a key way in doing it. And um, I never want to see too much videotape of Mark Allen because I thought, golly, he, he looks darn good on that run. I'll just kind of keep doing my thing and, and not be too wounded. Okay, and then you're in an adverse situation. So it, it might be a flat tire. It might be you get your, you know, you kicked in the face in the swim, or your goggles come off. Um, you get back to your bike, and your sunglasses aren't there. What are you gonna do? Um, stuff's gonna happen. Um, it, it could be anything, and, and it is really. I don't know if anyone's ever had a perfect race. Um, but you know, it, you go back to what we were saying earlier about you know what are the things you can control, and one of the things you can control is how you respond to it. Nick, uh, just lastly, just one quick, quick little follow up on on Christie's race uh, this past year, and I, I think it's important to recognize uh, what a true champion has. And and I, when I say this, it's not gee, it's just, it's just just an innate quality of our world's best, and not at all. Uh, I coach uh, a wide variety of athletes, including yourself, David, and uh, who's very talented. And I find that this ability, this psychological skill that we have to be able to adapt at the moment is really, really key. And in Chrissy's situation, before the uh, gun went off the day before the race, I looked her in the eyes and I said, Chrissy, there's no race plan. We have no race plan at all. I said, you're going to have to you're going to have to go with the flow and recognize the moment when you're going to have to make that key move. Uh, she was eight minutes slower on the swim, uh, well behind Marinda, which we felt was her key rival and, and the reigning champion from the previous year. Uh, she was able to catch Marinda near Javi, but, but only come in about three minutes and ten seconds ahead of her at the outset of the run, which is a small margin, and Marinda's a brilliant runner, as is Chrissy. Chrissy's plan, unbeknownst to me, but she recognized it at that moment, is that she had to put a psychological dent in Marinda. And from three minutes and 10 seconds, she increased that margin to five minutes and 20 seconds. And I was out on the course. I was seeing both of them run. Marinda's a beautiful runner. Chrissy's a great, elegant runner, but not as smooth, but can flow along. And, and that run, Chrissy was wounded. She was wounded. Her feet were splayed out to the side. She looked horrific. But she had developed this uh, lead of 5 minutes and 20 seconds. And all of a sudden, it started to, to whittle back down again at 17 miles. It went down to 5.05. And at 15 miles, it was 4.40. And I said, this could be close. Chrissy was aware of the time differential. She was doing everything she could. Marinda was doing everything she could to close that gap. And I think the most important thing in recognizing this is that uh, in Chrissy winning this race and, and holding on to a two-minute-plus lead at the end. Um, the, uh, the elegance of this race is really the psychological tenacity that she had within herself. And what we do to enhance the positive elements is that we don't dwell on what has just happened. We're always right at the moment. We're on this continuum. We're just looking ahead to our next step, and we're, we don't have this myopic view of, boy, I felt really bad two miles ago. What's going to happen? Is it really going to hit me? Uh, I get this question asked a lot, David, where people say, you know, if I feel good during the race, should I hold back? And I look at them totally befuddled, and I say, absolutely not. When you're in the flow, let it flow. Stay within yourself. And uh, just some final thoughts, and, and and just to reiterate some of the things um, you know David just talked about is you know being you know in the moment, not you know dwelling on the on the negatives, but rather you know just letting them go. Um, it, you know, and I always asking that question, you know, what did I what did I do right, and then being flexible. Yeah, and this is really uh, just a key one. Uh, Christy broke the world record in Roth in July. Uh, 2011, and uh, I was unable to attend the race. I was on the phone, of course, watching it online. She had crossed the finish line, and I was just able to contact her via phone. And when I was looking at her split, she had a beautiful uh, swim. And I thought to myself, comparatively to the men, 
Uh, she was a little bit slow on the bike, but it just had a superb run, running 244 off the bike, and, and uh, had really closed the second half of the run, which was one of the issues that we had addressed, that her, her closing was not there. And the first thing she said to me on the phone, she had just broke the world record. She said, Dave, my bike was a little bit slow. <laughs> and I just wanted to shake her. I couldn't. Um, and and I said to her, I said, Christy, you just broke the world record. Let's recognize what you have just done. And, and I think, what, Dave, what you, what, what you just said is, what did you do right? Well, she had a brilliant race. And, and I think this comes back to our last training session or our last race. Recognize what you've done well. And, and that's really, really key. So it allow you to step forward for your next event. OK, and that wraps up our formal presentation. And we, um, we'll make a copy of this available. Um, I, I think uh, Melissa is going to send out, from Train is going to send out an email follow-up that you'll be able to um, download a copy if you like it. Um, please feel free to contact us with any questions as both our uh, contact information. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Melissa. Thanks. Um, we have a couple questions for you guys. The first one, I'm going to try to paraphrase it. Um, the question is, I get emotional and start to get choked up at the end of the race, which makes it hard to breathe and compete. And it's not emotional and choking up out of pain, but it's just out of being so excited and having a great race, but it slows this person down. Is there any um, tips on how to turn those tears of joy into hunger to finish strong and not get choked up and not be able to not breathe? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, this, Melissa, just uh, to make sure I understand the question, this, this is actually during the race or at the outset of the race or near the end just, of the race? Just at the end. And, and I, yeah. you know, yeah, and you, like you see something, you're all excited. It's like you train for a half Ironman, you're finishing, you're doing it, and you just get overcome with these emotions and you, yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I think we, you know we've seen this in races where all of a sudden you see athletes physically sort of dismantle as they get close to the finish line, and they they, they lose that concentration. And, and you know it's 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 really important to allow yourself again, and we've hit this many many times to be right at the moment, and and all of a sudden it, it's so tangible you can almost kiss the finish line. It's it's there, and you're overcome with all this, and and you start losing control, losing physical control. I always tell my my athletes at the outset of the race and at the finish of the race to really think about one simplistic item, and that's your breathing, to take slow, deep inhalations, to concentrate on taking those slow, deep inhalations through your nose and your mouth, and to feel the exhale. And if you do that at the start of the swim or, be, or as you're staying there or getting ready in anticipation of the swim, and you're coming down that finish line shoot, and you're just overwhelmed. And, and we, we've all felt that. I mean, this is a fabulous moment when you've accomplished what you want to accomplish, but yet you're so darn close. Time-wise, uh, loss of speed, I'm sure it's, it's very negligible. But I, I think what this person is referring to is just I want to be able to control it. So hopefully that will help. Great. Thanks. Um, I have another question, and we got a good amount of questions regarding the swim. So this question is, what tips do you have for your first few open water swims to mentally prepare yourself and minimize anxiety? Uh, this is, you know, this is a tough one, and, and it's certainly a question that I've addressed before. And I don't know if I have the golden nugget, but I'll give you a, a few tips. Uh, the first one is before the start of the race, you have to be moving. Uh, and I mean, if you have time to get in the water before the, the start and you can actually warm up, stand in the water uh, for a minute or two. Just splash yourself lightly. Put your hands under water. You've got thermal receptors on your wrist and your hands. And, and that initial shock says, wow, this, this may feel cold to me. Try a few strokes. Stand up again where you're in shallow water and, and just kind of recognize that there's the first buoy. Come back to what I just said. If you think about the breathing and taking real deep breaths during your warmth, that will help. If you're unable to warm up, make sure that you're doing some dynamic stretches. That means big arm swings, 
uh, swinging from side to side, allowing your knees to bend, uh, mimicking the stroke patterns as if you're standing and doing the stroke, that's really good. And again, visualizing yourself of taking these breaths. And, and lastly, when you're in the water, uh, and I've mentioned this many team and training uh, pre-race chat, if you take a deep, slow inhalation in the first instruction, you actually look upward towards the sky and look at the sky, take a slow, deep, methodical breath, put your head back down and feel the bubbles or see the bubbles if the water clarity allows you to do that, and do that right at the outset. That will allow you, allow you to relax. L lastly, uh, you don't need to see the buoy on every stroke. I think people always want to think that, yeah, i got to go in a straight line. Take those first three to five strokes, thinking about your breathing, establish that initial tempo, and then taking a couple strokes where you're looking up, and then three or four down again. But uh, I think the tendency in open water is you know, I've got to have a straight line. Well, everyone will realize that when they're in open water, there's people crisscrossing, their legs are uh, crossed in front of them. People are going to be lightly pushing them, but no one's going to be pushing them under. Breathing, breathing, breathing. That's the key. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is um, if, if you have a chance uh, to get in and practice ahead of time, and so if at a, a clinic or um, yeah, ideally a clinic where there's lifeguards and stuff, um, I, I think that's that's a, a, a big key. And then it, it, as they said, you know, so as far as like the rules go, um, you know, if, if you get into and I, I've panicked a, a couple times. I'm a very confident swimmer, but I still have had you know water splashed in my face, or you know, I had to stop and you can you can just stop and tread water and you actually hold on to a boat um, or a watercraft if you need to, you know, wave your arms um, just to catch your breath and uh, let things settle down. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, looks like that's pretty much it for the time we have for questions and answers. Um, I want to thank you both for being here and doing the webinar. It's some really good information. Just a reminder for everybody, we, we're going to be archiving the webinar, so you'll have access to it. Um, there, the link for the webinar will be going out in an email to everybody, I believe, sometime tomorrow. If you want a copy of the slide set, um, just shoot us an email into support, and that email address is support at trainingpeaks.com, and our support folks will send that out to you. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude it, and thanks a lot for taking the time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.